So there are ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all of you who are following us uh, on this uh, online roundtable on Europe's need for more plasma before, during and uh, after COVID-19. Although I cannot uh, welcome you in person at the European Parliament as I would have liked, uh, it's a pleasure for me to host this online meeting with my colleague uh, Cesar Luena on uh, such a, a crucial um, topic. Uh, the discussion today is timely. The COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the need for more Europe in health matter in general, let me say. It has become even more evident that uh, even though we are part of a globalized world, we need to invest more for a stronger European autonomy when it comes to crucial medical devices uh, or active pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, during the round table, and uh, I want to thank uh, our speakers uh, who agreed to share with us their views today. Uh, during this round table, we will see how this applies to a critical starting materials uh, such as plasma. Uh, the demand for plasma derived uh, medicinal products uh, have been growing significantly uh, through the years. As you know, PD and PS are essential for a number of treatments and rare diseases. I'm referring, I'm referring to life-saving medicines for patients with rare and often genetic conditions uh, such as primary immunodeficiencies and uh, hemophilia. However, numbers show us that in Europe, we are still not collecting enough plasma to meet these patient needs uh, and consequently, we must depend on plasma imports, mainly from the US. Uh, the EU Parliament uh, highlighted uh, in uh, its uh, uh, September uh, resolution on medicine uh, shortages uh, that the EU must take action uh, to, to address its dependency on EU uh, plasma for the manufacture of PD and PS. We see that the Commission is one on the same line on its EU pharmaceutical strategy with its commitment to the accessibility of medicines, reduction of medicines shortages and securing strategic uh, uh, autonomy. In addition, the EU Commission very recently launched uh, a public consultation for an impact assessment to start the revision of the EU blood and tissue and cells legislations. The revision of these legislations can provide an opportunity not only to update the legislation to align with technological advancement, but also to address Europe's vulnerability as to its plasma collection. The added value of the EU is to come up with harmonized solutions for all citizens, which member states alone might not be able to reach this can be done certainly by triggering the collaboration between all stakeholders, as today we, we, we are doing. Uh, we will hear from a wide range of, of impacted stakeholders about the challenges they are facing, the issue they are identified with the current European framework, and the solution they are proposing to us, policymakers, to ensure that more plasma is collected in Europe, which is the goal that we all, uh, we all share. In this meeting. I know very well that there are different collection systems in different member states uh, and I believe that uh, as uh, it is in many, in many policy areas, the EU should make uh, this diversity a general benefit for all citizens. I'm personally a direct witness uh, as a blood donor in, in my country, in, in Italy, of a well-functioning public-private non-profit system, a system that is providing to be particularly resilient during this, this pandemic. And I believe this is also due to a strong and reliable network of around 1.7 million donators uh, that I might say in critical times can make a, a, a difference. And nevertheless, today the EU, uh, in, the, in the EU, we still have patients uh, encountering availability and access issues for their treatment with PD uh, MPS, and I believe that we need to announce the efforts and cooperation between all actors uh, to tackle this growing crucial uh, need of our times. So um, I want now to give the floor to Peter O'Donnell, uh, 
the moderator of this uh, round table that I want to thank for his uh, cooperation uh, to continue today's um, journey uh, on, on this uh, very uh, interesting issue. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Signora Bonafé, for your welcome. And thank you for introducing the subject of this round table so vividly. As you rightly point out, the, the real focus of discussions on plasma is that, that individual patient who, whose quality of life, whose very life itself perhaps, depends on access to plasma-derived medicines. And you also point out there are policy initiatives underway in Europe that could play a big role in improving conditions for securing supplies of plasma. And I, I'm absolutely confident the experts on our panel today will have plenty of technical observations about the possible solutions. But can I ask you, as a politician, what you believe the, the European Parliament and indeed MEPs themselves can do to promote or support a policy framework that will help to ensure that European citizens who need PDMPs will be able to get them? Oh, um, thank you for, for your question. Uh, um, of course, we are uh, legislators. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned, we are looking uh, forward to legislative proposals uh, from, the, from the European Commission. And this will be the occasion for, for moving on on, this, uh, on these issues. And uh, um, first of all, on the issue of the need of plasma from uh, derived medical products. Um, furthermore, let me say that uh, uh, finally, we are speaking uh, on making other steps uh, towards a health union, and uh, this could be uh, this is very important now. Why we are facing a pandemic, um, a very impacting pandemic, and therefore uh, I welcome the attention to 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 give more resources to health programs, um, and this could be another point that. Uh, uh, gives us the opportunity to go through also in the items that we have highlighted today. So from one side, we are waiting for legislative proposal. On the other side, we have more resources for health uh, uh, in general. And this is uh, uh, two points very important uh, for, for also for our discussion today. Okay, well, th thank you very much for that. And uh, I shall pick up some of those points that you make in our discussion with the speakers during the rest of the round table. Thank you once again for your welcome. Uh, and now as, as we move into the working session of this round table, uh, allow me perhaps just to make one thing clear uh, about myself. I'm a journalist and I'm conscious of the many aspects of the debate on plasma and the very many diverse points of view about sourcing and transforming plasma into medicines. But as a journalist, I, I take no sides in this. I'm just hugely sympathetic to the interests of the patients in need of these products. I should be listening, therefore, with great interest to the analysis and recommendations from our experts and asking questions as we go along. And you, too, in the audience, have the opportunity to ask questions as well. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And if you'd like to put your questions on there, I shall endeavor to raise as many as possible with, of them with the, our panelists as time allows. Uh, also, if you'll permit me, given the complexity of today's subject, perhaps I, I, must, I, I might just briefly explain up front exactly what we're talking about with plasma. It's a, plasma is, is a key element of blood. I mean, many of you already know this, but some of you may not have. I should promise to be brief on this. 55% of the total volume of blood is plasma. It's the clear straw colored liquid portion of blood that remains after the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the platelets and other cellular components have been removed. It can be obtained from donors. It can only be obtained from donors attending, uh, and some of them are attending specialized centers where a ferrous equipment allows it to be drawn directly from the donor, which is known as source plasma. That takes about an hour. It can also be obtained by separation from whole blood connected, uh, collected by classic transfusion services. That's called recovered plasma. Uh, that sort of blood donation takes about 15 minutes, can be done three or four times a year. Plasma can be donated with a pheresis much more often than that. 
the plasma is then fractionated. That's when its components are separated out for processing into treatments to be used in a wide variety of specific conditions, as uh, Simona was saying, from immunodeficiency to hemophilia. Now, after this clarification, let's turn to our real experts who will learn, uh, well, they'll tell us something of the, the growing impact of plasma on therapy, and particularly on new therapies, and of the many technical and cultural and policy factors that influence its provision. But all the time, I, I shall be acutely aware of that individual patient, and there are 300,000 of them in Europe, who's relying on his PDMP or her PDMP arriving on time, even though it would have taken a massive logistical exercise to get it to him or her. I, I was intrigued, amazed really, to learn that it can take more than 130 donations every year to keep supplying treatment to just one single patient with a primary immune deficiency. How much consistent provision does that presuppose from donors? And it can take as much as nine months to process a product from the time the source material is provided. What a fragile supply chain that presupposes. And now, given that Europe is well short of supplying its own requirements, and European clinical need is constantly increasing, what sort of measures are going to be needed to ensure that the patient keeps getting his or her treatment? Now, that's what we're going to be hearing about from our experts. Let's turn to the first of them, uh, Dr. Nizar Maloui of the Necker University Hospital in Paris. He's a pediatrician who's specialized in primary immunodeficiencies for 15 years. Dr. Necker, welcome to you. Please give us a physician's perspective on plasma-derived medicinal products and the related opportunities and challenges faced by physicians like you in Europe. Dr. Neka, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, uh, the PPTA uh, for organizing this uh, very important meeting um, on the very important um, topic that um, um, uh, Ms. Bonafé has uh, very kindly uh, hosted and uh, very nicely introduced along with, uh, with you um, uh, as well, Peter. Um, so, I said, I'm a pediatrician working in the field of uh, primary immune deficiency. So, primary immune deficiency patients um, have a, a high burden of their disease um, because of infections. Um, so, as I said, um, the, the patients with PID, primary immune deficiency, um, uh, suffer from infections, autoimmunity, autoinflammation, cancer, allergy, and uh, immunoglobulin um, um, uh, is the major mainstay treatment as a replacement therapy of their lack of antibodies, leading to uh, the symptoms and the comorbidities that have uh, highlighted. And this is a treatment that for which there is no alternative. There is basically no alternative for uh, patients with primary immune deficiencies who need immunoglobulin replacement therapy for their uh, uh, lifelong treatment. And the WHO has um, uh, ascribed uh, uh, PID as uh, one of the major uh, uh, condition uh, for um, immunoglobulin uh, um, uh, uh, distribution in case of, uh, of shortages as we are currently living, which is not a, a new topic, but definitely uh, is a topic that we see more and more frequently and with the COVID-19 situation will probably be, uh, we are facing uh, uh, another, uh, an, another stage of, uh, of these uh, shortages at the worldwide level um, for the next months. So there are basically very quickly three ways to uh, get the treatment, either by intravenous infusion, it's called IVIG, or either by subcutaneous infusion, it's called SCIG, and there is a, a specific feature of the sub-Q, which is called the facilitated sub-Q, uh, leading to a, a, a lower frequency of the infusions. Um, but the, the two uh, very important things that we as 
uh, uh, doctors, prescribers, but also the pharmacists, the patients, and also every stakeholder, the regulators, the industry, uh, uh, the plasma industry. We all uh, look into the quality and the safety and the, the tolerance of, the, of, the, of, the, of these uh, different products that are currently available at a worldwide level. And then there are another, you know, uh, lots of other indicators, uh, such as the volume, the trough level, the root, the frequency, the dose, which we need to adapt depending on whether we uh, need to uh, start the treatment into a, a, a very young child or an adult or maybe an elderly. So next slide, please. So um, uh, what about the availability of plasma products? Well, globally, IG therapies have been under tension for many years, as I said. And, and what we know from the epidemiology of the primary immune deficiencies, which is one of my um, areas of interest and research, it's that around 70% of PID patients in the world have not been diagnosed yet. So, and they are currently more and more diagnosed because of the high, uh, higher awareness of PID uh, around the globe. And again, that's another uh, work done, um, uh, at least in part by all stakeholders, including IPOP, the International Patient Organization for Primary Immune Deficiencies. Next slide. So the, uh, basically, the, as you can see here, the uh, increase in the demand of uh, immunoglobulin uh, product is, uh, has a steady slope um, across the years uh, from 2010 to today. And the forecasts seem to show um, uh, uh, the same kind of, 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 of increase. So it's really a high, uh, high burden on the, on the, on the, on the community and the, the, the plasma uh, fractionators and the donors as well. Next slide, please. So what we see here is a, a, a survey uh, made by the European network of pharmacists in the hospital uh, across EU countries, asking for shortages uh, uh, of drugs. And as you can see, immunoglobulin is uh, in the top three uh, in the 2018 survey. It's not the first one, actually. It's more an antibiotic. And the second is also, I think, very important in the field of uh, today, COVID-19 wise, but also uh, in the PID community, which is the uh, vaccinations. And as you can see, it's also uh, a matter of concern regarding the shortages. But immunoglobulin are clearly uh, a, a topic of concern. And next slide, please. So that's the uh, latest uh, the latest survey made by, um, so last year, made by the same network. And again, blood derivative, uh, der derivative products uh, come uh, into uh, the third uh, place again, so including immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So what, um, what we, um, we, uh, we need is to really reinforce the framework of conditions in prescribing and using IG. Uh, uh, and we need to, to really um, make everybody concerned about the current and the foreseen shortages at the global and worldwide level. We need to make sure that the immunoglobulin use is, uh, is, is properly um, uh, made as a, an, uh, and, as, and also addressed as an actual public health issue. Um, we need, as a, as a physician, I'm really con uh, concerned about the habits of prescribing of my colleagues. And uh, because we all need to ensure that the patients who need these treatments, and not only patients with primary immune deficiencies, but other patients as well, uh, should receive that uh, at the proper level of uh, pathology and, and without any uh, delay. Next slide, please. So what we've done in France is to work together with all scientific societies uh, and, and, and the, the, the regulators, the Ministry of Health, the patient associations, and, and, uh, and we came up with uh, this uh, 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 document, which has a, a, a regulatory uh, aspect and that you can really, um, um, uh, it serves like um, something like a law, I guess. It's not a law per, per se, but it's really, uh, it has a high 
a level of, a, of, a, of, a, of a credibility. And um, it's the prioritization, uh, with, these are the red dots, and the blue dots is for the diseases in which there are alternatives, alternative treatments, such as corticosteroids, for example, or others, or plasma pheresis. And the black dots, which you can't see here because it's a eight pages document, it's uh, diseases or conditions in which immunoglobulin are not, I mean, these diseases are not considered as prioritary in case of uh, shortages for, um, for immunoglobulin. So we update that uh, document every year. And we did it twice this year because of the COVID-19 uh, situation. Next slide, please. So um, um, uh, we, uh, we, need, we need to make sure that uh, uh, patients are not limited in their access to health and to their treatment. Um, many patients, especially during the COVID-19, uh, in many EU countries, have been switched to um, um, uh, subcutaneous home treatment because of, you know, in order to avoid these patients to be exposed to the, to the virus uh, upon them coming to the hospital at the day, uh, day hospital to receive their IV infusion. But that came with some, you know, an increase of tension into, um, you know, providing uh, uh, the sub-QIG by the companies and the pharmacists. Current, con 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 Sorry, at the same time, there was a drop in blood and plasma collection at the worldwide level, and uh, especially in the, in, the, in the US, but also in the EU. And uh, uh, we are, we've, we've already seen uh, signals of decreased levels of IG products in some countries. So clearly the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need of evidence-based decision-making and collaboration across all stakeholders uh, 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 at the international uh, level. Next slide. So um, I was asked to maybe think and give some food for thought as uh, areas of improvement. Uh, so at the short uh, slash middle term, uh, we can think of risk uh, management plans and management plans per se, uh, because they will remain highly, they are, and they will remain highly important. Maybe the example of um, working on a prioritization of indications in case of tension of immunoglobulin of supply could uh, be uh, you know, extended at the EU or maybe international level. Um, we should probably recognize that the, uh, the specificity of these drugs as it was mentioned during the introduction, and also that we need a wider range of products uh, because of uh, the chronicity of the diseases. And, and uh, this is important to uh, mention that uh, all IG products are not interchangeable. It's not a, ge a generic product. They are, all have their specificities. And again, PDMPs, plasma-derived medicinal products, have a latency of around 10 months for manufacturing. So when there is a, a drop in the plasma collection, we will see the effects you know, up to 10 months from then. Next slide, please. I think it will be the last slide. So at a more middle slash long term, uh, maybe we could work on in, you know, thinking and discussing how we could increase the supply and the free movement of safe and efficacious PDMTs because of patients' growing needs, not only in PIV, but in many, many, many areas of medicine working on the developing uh, guidelines, policy, and leg leg legislations based on facts and science and our ex experience of patients and, 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 and healthcare professionals. Recovered plasma should not be wasted as it is seen in some uh, settings and in some countries. Also develop and strength the plasma for races programs when possible as um, one way, maybe the only way to increase the plasma connection, collection strongly uh, enhance the, uh, encourage the coexistence of private, public and private plasma collection as it is uh, done uh, today, but maybe we could um, enhance these uh, interactions. And uh, uh, safety of patients mean global sufficiency of PDMP uh, based on a regionally balanced plasma collection. And always, as you mentioned, uh, Peter, in your introduction, think about patient 
uh, as a, take the patient uh, point of view in, in, in our uh, discussions and our uh, decisions. Thank you for your uh, attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Niza, if I may presume again to familiarity, uh, you've given us some very helpful overviews of the need, the use, and indeed of the potential risks to supply. I'm particularly struck by what you say about the uh, not just increasing need, but the potential uh, area of undiagnosed or insufficiently diagnosed problems. So you're, you're it, just very briefly, you're very confident of the fact that there is a genuine need for continuing increase in supplies of plasma for you and physicians like you. Yes, we, we see uh, that immunoglobulins are widely uh, used in many different uh, specialties for a growing number of indications. Uh, so we will need more uh, plasma collection in order to uh, produce more immunoglobulin in order to uh, um, give uh, access to that uh, treatment to uh, as many patients as possible. Okay. Well, look, there's many things I'd love to come back to and I'm sure our audience who are already putting questions in through the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. And so we'll come back and look at some of these things and the ideas you've come up with there uh, a little later. Uh, and uh, thank you very much in the meantime for your uh, initial setting of the scene there. I'd now like to uh, provide an overview of the supply situation from Matthew Hotchcook, who's the president of the Marketing Research Bureau that specializes in analyzing and forecasting data on plasma collection, supply, fragmentation right around the world. Uh, Matthew knows the subject from the inside since he used to work in the industry. Now he's uh, one of the key guys in producing figures on it. So Matthew, please update us on the latest supply situation and particularly as it affects Europe. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to the organizers, the PPTA, and um, this is Simona Bonafé for the uh, for the invitation to to share some of the figures uh, that uh, my company collects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just brief um, explanation for the audience of where much of this data comes from. It comes comes from a, a lot of legwork at uh, myself and others uh, who work uh, for for me and the company uh, collect on a daily basis from government sources and company sources, et cetera. So you'll see a lot of these figures uh, for the European market particularly, as well as global on plasma collections and immunoglobulin usage, which uh, I call IG usage in the presentation. Next slide. So uh, kind of three topics, uh, but we'll spend the most on the third one. Um, I just want to let uh, everyone uh, start with a little bit of laying the groundwork making sure everyone understands the current situation when it comes to plasma used for fractionation uh, and, and its ori origin by region or by continent around the world. I can make a brief comment about where it's fractionated, but uh, spend most of the time on the third point, which is um, trying to show the balance between plasma collection in Europe as a whole region or the EU and individual countries within the EU and Europe, and the need, the clinical need for immunoglobulins, and to show that it's not evenly distributed between the countries. The next slide. Okay, this is a very uh, important uh, ground setting uh, kind of data to show that while plasma, uh, you, when I say plasma, I'm referring to plasma used for fractionation, not for those who might need plans of transfusion for surgical or other reasons. But the plasma used for fractionation is collected globally, but as this pie chart on the left shows, it is by no means equally balanced. Um, and uh, North America, which is over 99% of the United States, uh, collects uh, over two thirds of the global plasma used for fractionation. Uh, the focus here, Europe, collects 14% based on numbers from last year. And I'll get into what's changed in 2020 because the coronavirus pandemic has caused differences. But um, you know, this is the, is, the, is the kind of the baseline. We see that's not at all uh, 
distributed equally based on either population or, as I'll show you later, on usage of the products. So next slide. And uh, so that, that was the global look. Now let's take the global look based on two different kinds of plasma. As uh, Peter so eloquently stated at the beginning uh, of this session, there is two kinds of plasma that is used for fractionation. fractionation. One that is collected uh, and separated from whole blood donations that Red Cross and other organizations would collect. Uh, and that is called recovered plasma. And that is the blue line at the bottom of the chart. Uh, and the other type of plasma is uh, plasma collected solely for the purpose of collecting plasma with apheresis machines, uh, also called plasmapheresis or source plasma. That is the gray line, uh, more towards the middle. And uh, the, the trends of this 20-year uh, period is obvious. Uh, recovered plasma used for fractionation has gone nowhere. It is nearly the same as it was 20 years ago, while source or apheresis plasma has increased very steadily for the last 15 plus years uh, and has been the source of all the growth in the uh, industry. And, and I should mention that source plasma is mainly collected by private uh, companies, uh, but there also are, especially in Europe, uh, public agencies, blood collection agencies that collect source plasma. Whereas recovered plasma is pretty much only collected around the world by uh, public uh, organizations. Next slide. So let's move on to the need of European patients for specifically focusing on immunoglobulin versus plasma collected in that same region. Next slide. All right, so here is uh, some data. Uh, for 2019, last year, on plasma collected in Europe. And uh, you see here the two blue sections of the pie chart are public organizations such as Red Crosses or other government or pseudo-government organizations that collect plasma, usually as a monopoly in various countries. And the brownish colored one is the private source collection uh, that operates in four countries. Uh, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, and Hungary. And uh, a total of 9.7 million liters was collected last year. Uh, and 61% uh, was collected by public agencies across uh, the, the total 25 plus countries. And 39% was collected by the private companies who only again operated in four European countries with a, a total population of about 112 million or 15% of the total. So uh, just from a, a ratio perspective, 15% uh, of the population uh, is providing 39% of the source. It's basically on a per capita basis, four times as much um, on those countries that collect public plus private versus those that only collect public. And I'll show you more data on that in a second. And this ratio has been going up by the way. Older data showed it was three, three and a half times as much. So we've seen that the four countries uh, with public and private are increasingly pulling their weight in providing plasma for the entire European continent. Next slide. So here I'm going to show, here showing the uh, growths between 2010 and 2019 of the public sector, public meaning um, the, the primarily government or pseudo-government organizations, who collect both uh, whole blood, of which part of that is separated for plasma fractionation, and also a of plasma. So those are lumped together in all the public. And then the private, which again is, is operates in these four countries in Europe. And uh, the public sector has grown, uh, especially in the last few years, they, they put an emphasis towards increasing plasma fractionation due to the need of the, pro of, of the patients. But the, the nine year growth has been 1.4% per year. Um, and that's driven by a couple of countries that have really made a big effort, such as Italy, but that's far less than the demand for the, pa for the patients, uh, for the products, for immunoglobulin, which has been over 7% over that same period. Um, the private collection at 5.4% per year is a little bit closer to the organic immunoglobulin growth in the, in the countries, in the regions, but still falls slightly short uh, for the whole market. So. Um, that means that what we have is an increasing deficit between product needed and plasma collected, as I'll show in a second. 
Next slide. So just to back up a little bit uh, and show the whole picture globally, this chart on the left uh, is, is showing just immunoglobulin usage in the year 2018. It was about 210 metric tons of immunoglobulins used or by patients uh, of all, all needs uh, around the globe. Europe was just one quarter, 25%. See North America dominated by the United States is a little under half half of the total market and then the rest of the regions. All right, click next slide or next click. Now we see uh, this uh, chart on the right, which I showed you previously. This is the same one. This is showing you where the plasma is collected. And uh, I just wanted to point out, next slide again or next click, that uh, Europe uses 25% of the immunoglobulins of the world, but only collects 14% of the plasma used for fractionation. So you can see right there, if all plasma uh, fractionated into IG is consumed, which is currently the case, if you use 25% but only contribute 14%, you have a deficit. And that's exactly the case that we see in Europe and uh, also in other markets, as you'll see. Next slide. So this is uh, taking some of that same data from those two previous charts, but putting it into uh, uh, plasma volumes needed language here. Um, I'll just focus on the first two, North America and Europe. Uh, North America collects, collects, which is an orange, far more plasma than the patients in North America can currently consume or use. Uh, Europe uh, in, and all the other markets, in, incidentally, are the opposite. The plasma needed uh, is 14.5 uh, million liters of plasma would be needed for all the patients to produce the Ig needed for all the patients. But only 9 million liters was collected. This was in 2018. 2019, that the European plasma collect was 9.7, but the IG was also higher. And I don't have that, that figure, but, um, but uh, it was also higher. So the deficit still persists. So click next slide. This just shows you the, the percentage of deficit or how much more plasma would be needed to collect to reach uh, regional self sufficiency. And that number is 38%. In Europe, and that's 38% in Europe as a whole. And so it's clear to see here that what's happening is extra plasma collected in the US is being fractionated product and distributed to the, all of the other regions, actually. Next slide. So now let's go uh, a little bit more granular and look at uh, some of the countries. Uh, and the top four, which are shown in color red, are countries which have both the public and private plasma collections. Uh, and the bottom four have only public collections. They have generally monopoly government organizations collecting all the plasma used for fractionation in those countries. Um, and uh, I have quite a few columns here, but uh, kind of what's needed for IG is towards the left with the fourth column over the difference. If the difference is negative, that means that they're collecting more than they're needing in that country. If it's positive, it's the other way around. But then if you look all the way over to the right, the right is how much additional plasma would be needed if that country wanted to be completely self-sufficient in producing immunoglobulins for the needs of the patients in that country. And you see uh, for the four countries in red, all of those that have public and private uh, plasma collections, they don't need to collect any more plasma for the needs of their own patients for immunoglobulins. While the four countries in black down below would need to collect based on uh, the year 2017 data, and 2020 is not gonna look much better, um, need to collect that much more liters of plasma to meet the needs of the patients in that own, in, in their country. Um, so you see those numbers are, are fairly large. Uh, next slide. And so uh, this chart shows, again, the plasma needed for immunoglobulins in blue for each country and the plasma collected in that country in orange. Um, click once again. The, uh, the four countries with public and private, they all have a surplus of several hundred thousand liters extra plasma that plasma is being made into products and sent, in often cases, to the poor countries on the right and others in Europe that all have deficits. Next again. 
Uh, the four countries on the right, uh, four major uh, European countries, three of them in the European Union, have a deficit. Um, in the case of France, over 1.6 million liters plasma deficit. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that this is not a Venn diagram because there is no overlap between the two. There is no country in Europe that has both private and public plasma freezes, which also has a deficit of plasma. Um, all of them that, that have both uh, operating systems in their country have a surplus. And, and, and I, while I don't show every European country here, I, I can tell you all the other major European countries, Belgium, um, Netherlands, uh, and uh, Sweden, they would have a deficit as well. So it's pretty clear uh, to me uh, which countries have figured out a system to collect enough for their, for their patients uh, if, if we look at it that way. Next slide. I want to switch a little bit and talk about what's gone on since 2019 because I showed you data from 2019 and uh, 2017 and the previous times. Of course, the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic uh, has caused a lot of changes in the last year. And uh, many of you know that has affected blood collections and plasma collections. Uh, I, I, I just to the second point, I would say that uh, for a lot of reasons, plasma collections dropped starting in March in many countries between state home orders, confinements, uh, fear of getting disease, uh, people choosing to stay home, less business activity, etc. We have seen uh, quite a bit of um, or quite a drop in plasma collections in, in uh, quite a few markets, at least for part of the year. Uh, but uh, because the U.S. market provides you know, about 38 percent of uh, European IG needs, um, it's, it, it, what happens in the U.S. affects Europe very much in this market, almost directly related. And uh, the U.S. market is going to be about 10 to 15 percent lower in 2020 plasma collections versus uh, the previous year, 2019. So that's it's probably 13, maybe 14 percent is what the total 2020 drop is compared to the previous year. Uh, I think Europe is a little less, but also Europe is collecting less this year than 2019. Um, so what that means in terms of the supply of immunoglobulins is that uh, starting now, this fourth quarter of this year, and continuing at least six, probably up to 12 months, uh, less IG is being produced, and so less IG is available for the patients around the world. And um, how that IG is going to be allocated is complicated. Um, and, uh, and it's largely determined uh, by a lot of factors, but the companies ultimately have a, a lot of say in how that's done. Uh, but it's reasonable to assume the countries uh, that produce more plasma will get a higher allocation of the product if a shortage persists. Next slide. So just to conclude, uh, I think I showed uh, very clearly the US is the world's dominant and main supplier of plasma. And when it comes to Europe, the, um, the, the plasma, about almost 40%, is coming from the US and this coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19, has exacerbated the problem of uh, reliance on other regions for plasma as the US has uh, had a drop this year. Um, going forward, I think if this pandemic uh, subsides in 2021, I think you will see the US plasma collection return to growth. But if fundamentals don't change, which means if either demand doesn't keep increasing, as uh, Dr. Malawi said, it's likely to in Europe, or plasma doesn't grow faster in Europe, the deficit for European usage of IG versus plasma collected in Europe is going to increase. And this is going to be meaning more and greater reliance on the United States for plasma. If chain fundamentals don't change, then finally, diversification of plasma sources is increasingly imperative and that would require more plasma to be collected in Europe in addition to other regions. Next slide. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Here's my contact information if you have more questions or would like to uh, provide some insight. Thank you very much, Matthew. A splendid uh, view of the complex movement and uh, production of uh, or collection of plasma. Uh, I, I'm very struck by that final slide where you talk about if the fundamentals don't change. You indicated briefly what you were thinking of there in terms of supply and demand. 
But can I ask you to expand just a little more on your view of the fundamentals and what the key factors will be in influencing the future availability of plasma in Europe? Sure, sure. Yeah, well, I, we, there's two there's two aspects, which is one is the supply, which I spent most of this presentation focusing on, which is plasma. And uh, as, as you see, um, the, the collections, uh, the companies, or the, rather the countries with region, uh, only public plasma collections really do uh, struggle to collect enough plasma. Um, I, as an American, I don't find that surprising. Um, it, it, you need a lot of plasma uh, to, really a lot of plasma collected to satisfy the needs of IG patients. You mentioned 130 donations just for one patient for a year's supply. That's a lot. Uh, most uh, blood donors, they don't want to donate plasma 10 or 20 times or even more per year. They, they want to donate a few times, uh, maybe either whole blood or maybe apheresis source plasma, but um, they're not willing to do it 10 or 20 times. And surveys bear that out. Uh, but the, the calculation changes if there's compensation, as there is in Germany or Czech Republic, for example. There are donors who donate uh, frequently because it's a source of income for them. And so um, that allows those countries to collect much more plasma from donors who are donating 10 or 20 times per year. Because um, you need a lot of single donor single time or once a year donors to equal a very frequent plasma donor. Okay, well, thank you, very, <clears throat> thank you very much for that clarification. Again, an awful lot of material there you provided us with, and thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll be coming back to a lot of that in the discussion uh, when we get round to the Q&A. So thank you for the moment. Now, with that very helpful background on, on demand and supply of plasma, we can now move on to look at how plasma is seen by patients, regulators, producers, policymakers, and donors. First, I'll give each member of our panel the chance for an initial presentation, and then we'll go into a question and answer session when they've all been able to give their initial views. You in the audience again are encouraged also to join in, send your questions in through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and deal with all of them. But now I'm going to start this session by asking Johan Prevo, who's the Executive Director of the International Patient Organization for Primary and Immunodeficiencies, to give us the view from the patients. Johan, please. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and I'll start by thanking the organizers uh, for the kind invitation and, and Mrs. Bonafé for hosting uh, this very important um, event. Next slide, please. So um, as uh, you would have seen uh, from, from my first slide, I'm the executive director of IPOPI, uh, which stands for International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies. And our organization essentially represents national associations of patients everywhere in the world and quite obviously uh, in the EU. So when we reflect, ref, uh, reflect about primary immunodeficiencies and how, um, where we stand today, the first thing to say is that they represent a substantial group of rare disorders with over 430 types of primary immunodeficiencies identified uh, to this day. They affect the immune system of patients and uh, they vary in severity. So they go from uh, being life impairing conditions to life threatening very severe conditions. And a majority of our patients will need lifelong immunoglobulin replacement therapy to be able to live um, a, a normal life. Obviously, immunoglobulin therapies are made from plasma as we've heard from uh, the previous presenters and therefore uh, today's topic is, is very, very important to our community. Next slide, please. So um, as such, we have been, um, as a patient community, very um, involved around the topic uh, of plasma collection. And for us, um, it's a clear priority. Um, and this slide just shows you some of the recent activities that we've been engaging in. We have launched uh, awareness campaigns asking for uh, donors to come forward and, and donate their plasma. And so we've tried to raise awareness on the need for, for plasma. 
Um, and this is not something uh, that we've done just because of COVID-19. It's, it's an issue that has been, uh, uh, you know, a historical issue for patient community. And so we continue to really drive awareness campaigns to try to collect more plasma. We've also been involved uh, in various other uh, activities. As, as you can see on the slides, we took part in some of the discussions around the ECDC report on substances of human origin in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we participated uh, in the conference uh, and many uh, consultations organized by the European Commission uh, in the area of the EU legislation on blood tissues and cells. And more recently, we've also been uh, involved in a consultation with the WHO uh, about the supply of PDMPs in low and middle income countries. And just in September, uh, we were involved in the organization of a roundtable on a similar topic uh, than today's roundtable uh, organized under the PLUS platform. Next slide, please. So the current landscape uh, for primary immunodeficiency patients is, is the following one. Uh, I've mentioned that today uh, we represent 430 primary immunodeficiencies. Uh, that's a big difference from 10 years ago when only 130 uh, primary immunodeficiencies were known. And according to some of our experts, at least, we could be looking at as many as 1,000 types of primary immunodeficiencies by the year 2030. We've also witnessed uh, an Im improvement in the diagnosis rates of primary immunodeficiency, which obviously, uh, as Dr. Manawi uh, said in his presentation, will lead to increasing demand. We also see um, a definite um, uh, important increase, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, and forcing to continue in the area of secondary immunodeficiencies, which uh, will also have an impact on, on driving further demand. And whilst these um, uh, foreseen increases are somewhat balanced by new uh, alternative therapeutic approaches, particularly for uh, neurological uh, indications um, where immunoglobulin is uh, currently used with, for example, the uh, increasing hope that uh, some specific inhibitors will be able uh, to replace um, uh, the role that immunoglobulins have played for these patients. Uh, it is a fact that demand for Ig therapies has continued to grow steadily, uh, as Matthew Ochko uh, pointed out in his presentation, and is not forcing to change in the next years. And so we strongly uh, also believe that Ig therapies are bound to continue to drive the whole field of plasma-derived uh, medicinal products. Uh, it's also a field whose dynamics have changed over the years. Uh, with uh, immunoglobulin and albumin at the moment really driving the field uh, forward. And uh, one certainly can uh, wonder what the situation will be uh, comes the end of this uh, decade. And I'm not sure, for example, that albumin will still be so much in the picture. So there is a, a potential uh, increasing role, in fact, for immunoglobulins to really drive, drive the whole field. And on the picture there on the slide, you see a recent uh, article which I've co-authored uh, with Professor Stephen Jollis, if you're interested in the details behind uh, the, the various points I've just mentioned in my slide. Next slide. And so in terms of access uh, issues, um, Again, some, some of the messages have been uh, very well highlighted uh, by Dr. Malawi uh, in his presentation. Uh, I think for us, for sure, uh, when I say for us, for the PID patient community, uh, you know, we have had a recurrent history of shortages and supply tensions on immunoglobulins. Uh, obviously, the COVID-19 is exacerbating uh, this issue in particular at the moment. I think what is key when you are confronted to uh, issues of, of shortages or supply tensions is to have proper demand management uh, policies in place uh, to ensure that patients who don't have alternative to their uh, immunoglobulin uh, treatments, which is the case for PID patients, can continue uh, to access them. Uh, the other point I wanted to highlight is the fact that immunoglobulins are not generic medicines. There are differences in how they, they will be tolerated uh, between different patients. And so the gold standard approach to immunoglobulin therapies is really to view them as personalized treatments. And I think that's an important point 
uh, to keep in mind. When it comes to COVID-19 uh, specifically, uh, certainly uh, we, we just heard, and I was very happy to read about the uh, data from uh, Matthew Otko on the, on the uh, impact that uh, the Marketing Research Bureau is estimating uh, for the year uh, 2020 and the impact of COVID-19 on plasma donations. Um, obviously, uh, the fact that the production process of these therapies is about 10 months uh, long, we believe that we will really be feeling the impact in 2021. Uh, but we are already seeing some, um, uh, some supply tensions happening uh, in the EU. I've outlined a few countries where we have had uh, our patient organizations reporting problems uh, with uh, the supply of immunoglobulins to various degrees of, of severity at the moment. But the first signs that um, supply tensions are again returning to the EU when it comes to immunoglobulins are definitely being felt already. And uh, we estimate that uh, most likely uh, these signs will continue to increase uh, and, um, and that we will uh, witness more uh, supply uh, issues comes 2021. So next slide, please. And so uh, you will recognize this slide from uh, uh, the, the uh, presentation also of Dr. Mallory. I should point out that actually this slide uh, was first presented not um, in the context of COVID-19, but in the context of the uh, EU uh, conference organized by the European Commission on the revision of the blood tissues and cells legislation in October 2019. And so as you can see, in October 2019, uh, the patients behind these slides, and essentially the slide was prepared by uh, not only IPOPI, but uh, in collaboration with uh, other patient organizations relying on PDMPs under the patient's platform called PLUS. Um, you can see that the points are not new. Um, you know, we were already calling for an increased supply uh, and free movement of safe and efficacious PDMPs uh, to meet patients' growing needs. And again, that links back to what I've said about the history of supply tensions and, and shortages to the point that today supply has really become the main safety issue for patients relying uh, on, on PDMPs. And so we encourage a free flow of PDMPs in the EU and globally uh, so that they can reach the patients who need them. Um, again, uh, bearing in mind that PDMPs are personalized treatments. We also call in for the development of guidelines, policy and legislation to be based on fact, science and experience. Um, certainly one fact today um, is that the world, including the EU, as we've heard, depends largely on compensated plasma donations, mainly coming from the US plasma donors. Uh, we also know that um, uh, countries that um, have uh, put in place a coexistence of the two sectors tend to collect more than others in the EU, as we've heard from the previous uh, presenters. And we also know from the European Medicines Agency that both PDMPs made from compensate plasma or voluntary and paid plasma donations have equivalent safety profiles. And so I, I really think that the needs of patients and care uh, is what needs to be driving uh, future legislation uh, in, in the area. So we also have called for uh, avoidance of wastage of plasma and particularly recovered plasma. Developing and strengthening plasma phoresis programs whenever possible. We saw recent initiatives uh, from the European Commission, uh, uh, for example, through the funding of plasma pheresis infrastructure uh, with a view to collect more convalescent uh, plasma during the COVID-19 pandemic through their emergency support uh, instrument uh, as very good signs that the, the, the EU is committed to work uh, on these programs. And I think an important uh, question would be to try to understand how this new infrastructure that is being funded by the Commission may actually be used uh, in the future, not only to collect convalescent plasma, but also to collect regular uh, plasma. So we strongly encourage the coexistence, uh, as I've said um, already, and, and certainly we would uh, encourage EU policymakers to look at the best practice examples among uh, the EU member states when reviewing or updating the relevant legislation. Uh, safety of patients means global sufficiency based on regionally balanced plasma collection, 
uh, is one of our uh, uh, additional key points here. And uh, what that means is that we believe that each region, including the EU, should do more to collect more plasma to reduce dependency on mainly one region. And not with a view to isolate ourselves in the EU, which is why we talk about sufficiency and not self-sufficiency, but really because PDMPs should circulate between regions for good reasons. We've heard about Dr. Malauli uh, talking about the importance of patient-centered care and individualized uh, patient approaches, meaning the right product should be reaching the right patient. But also reducing, obviously, the risk of shortages should one region deal with any issues such as a viral outbreak disrupting their collection. So we think we need to think globally uh, when it comes to PDMPs. We see this well with COVID-19, um, the need for convalescent plasma, potentially hyperimmune globulins. We would want these treatments to reach patients wherever they live uh, in the world. So I think it's important that right now we are dealing with a context, uh, with quite an exceptional context with, with, with the pandemic. And, um, and an impact on, on plasma collection and blood collections, in fact, which is interesting because usually when there is a humanitarian crisis, we see blood donations and plasma donations going up. The exact opposite for the reasons we've mentioned has been happening with COVID-19. But I think we need to have the long-term view of um, you know, coming out of this pandemic and being in a regular uh, situation where patients should really be able to reach the most appropriate treatments uh, for them. And so the future of EU legislation on PDMPs should be patient-centered. As I've said, once again, that doesn't remove anything about the importance of donors, both blood donors and, and plasma donors are obviously very important, but we need, I think, to really uh, recenter discussions around the fact that we're doing that to reach the patients with life-saving treatments. I think there have been um, uh, important uh, initiatives uh, around the EU rare diseases uh, field um, where patient centeredness has been uh, really promoted and knowing that most plasma derived medicinal products actually treat rare diseases. I think this is a direction that the next uh, blood tissues and cells legislation should also uh, be looking at. And um, certainly from uh, the recent uh, developments uh, that we've seen, we've seen the European Commission uh, publishing uh, just a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, its first inception um, impact assessment, uh, which is one of the steps towards the revision uh, of the legislation. And I can certainly say uh, on, on behalf of IPOPI at least, uh, that we are looking with much interest uh, in these developments. We certainly welcome the fact that in this um, inception uh, impact assessment, the commission um, has referred uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, which demonstrates the need to collect more plasma, to have more balance uh, between regions when it comes to plasma collection. But it's also putting forward um, the notion of doing this for the patients, which obviously uh, we welcome very much. Um, so this is it for me. Um, and obviously, um, I, I look forward to participate in the discussion uh, after the, the next presentations. Thank you very much, Johan. That's splendid and it's given us a very good perspective on the patient uh, view. Now, to make sure we've got time for Q&A at the end, I'm going to go straight on to our next speaker, who is uh, the first of our look at the questions of plasma through the eyes of the authorities. So let me invite uh, Dr. Luis puig Rovira to take the floor. He is the medical director of the Blood and Tissues Bank in Barcelona and a key figure in the Catalan region's blood and plasma network. Uh, as Matthew pointed out in his presentation, I'm sure Dr. Push will explain in more detail. In Spain, all plasma collection is through the non-profit public sector, as is the case, in fact, in most EU member states. So, Dr. Push, please give us your view of plasma from your perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your invitation to participate in this in very interesting meeting about plasma and PDMPS. I will present the reality of my country and the perspective for the, for the near future. E, next slide, please. In this slide, I explain or I show you the Spanish scenario. Spain is a country with 46 million inhabitants. It's divided in 17 
autonomous communities and uh, each one with a broad bank with different managing uh, models. Each broad bank established their own objectives and strategies. Their activity is very variable between 10,000, the little one, or the small one broad bank, to 250,000, the biggest one. The global quantity of plasma to PDMPS is uh, 382,000 liters of plasma and this is the sufficiency in uh, the percentage of sufficiency of different proteins 39 percent the icg albumin 56 percent factor uh, 8 51 and factor 9 57. next slide please bst Blood and tissue bank is the only blood bank for the 7.5 million inhabitants in Catalonia. In this table, you can see our activity related to plasma and PDMPS. During the last six years, we have increased the quantity of plasma volume from uh, PDMPS. Mm, uh, and also we have increased the production of immu uh, IgG. But the increase of uh, IgG use is much, much more uh, important than the production. For the reason, the percentage of sufficient has decreased uh, to 50% in 2040 to 38% in 2019. With this quantity of plasma, we are uh, self-sufficient in factor 9, factor 8, and alpha-1 antitrypsin, and quite uh, sufficient in albumin. Our level is 90%. Next slide, please. What is the what sufficient uh, we we need when we think about the meaning of sufficient or what sufficient do we want? It's useful to read this paper written by Professor Ganson in 18, uh, 1989. He correlates a sufficiency with PDMPS clinical need not to the PDMPS use or consumption. And I think this question is very interesting because the difference between clinical needs and use of this kind of products. Next slide, please. I would like to show you this study published in 2010 about IgG use uh, in different uh, Spanish hospitals. It analyzed 1,287 prescriptions in these hospitals. The conclusion is that 50% of IgG was used in authorized indication, essentially immunodeficiencies, in which the administration of IgG is completely mandatory. 25% uh, was used in, at that moment, of label diseases with evidence of effectiveness, uh, the, essentially several neurological autoimmune diseases, and the other 25% uh, in diseases with no evidence of clinical effectiveness. This result, uh, next slide, please. These results were also seen in the report about ICJ use in Canada. Studies done in different regions of this country suggest that a significant proportion of ICJ use falls outside established criteria, ranging from 10 to 36 percent. I don't think that this situation is specific of Spain and, and Canada. Maybe it's also common in other countries. Next slide. Reason we can ask if 
is it possible to establish for the use of PDMPS programs similar to patient blood management? These programs have produced an important decrease in red blood cells concentrate use. Here in this graph, we can see the reduction of uh, red blood cell concentrate in our uh, in Catalonia uh, due to this kind of practices. All these questions are reasonable, but really it's necessary to increase the quantity of plasma to obtain more uh, ICG. Our objective in Catalonia is to be sufficiency in the 50% of IgG needs. This is about 319,000 uh, grams in a short period of time. To obtain this uh, quantity of this protein is necessary to get 87 liters of plasma and doing around 54,000 plasma pheresis. At that moment, we perform about 20-25 plasma pheresis per year. If I consider all Spain, we need more than 117,000 uh, plasma pheresis. Next. And how to uh, achieve this sufficiency? In Spain, a non-public and non-retributive model is mandatory by law. So, we agree with this legal prescription and with the uh, International Society of Blood Transfusion or WHO uh, recommendations. Next slide. Our, uh, this is our plan to obtain more and more plasma next year. First one is to increase the information and social visibility. There are a lot of people who don't know that it's possible to give plasma. Look for the complicity of authorities and other social personalities. Have plasma donation centers near the population and also use the mobile units to be near the people who wants to give plasma. Facilitate the transport of the donors and provide public transport tickets or parking. It's necessary to say thanks to the donors, but maybe also uh, give little gift uh, to, the, to these donors. We think that it's necessary a personal recognition and also organize social events in order to increase the interest of the people to give plasma. And also it's necessary to think about the donor safety. Next slide, please. Uh, 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 some final comments before I finish. An increase in the number of plasmapheresis is needed in order to treat at least immunodeficiencies and uh, other private uh, ICG indications. It is possible to rationalize the use of ICG because the, uh, it's necessary to uh, an effort for the donor population. Each IgG doses need a good reason or a justification. Do we need to have periodic IgG use audits? And uh, in our country, we need national or maybe international agreements to manage the excess in some PDMP as coagulation factors, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and maybe in the near future, also albumin. I would like to say, a final comment. I, I represent only myself and my institution, but I think there are a lot of professionals or other blood banks and, uh, from other countries, maybe France, Holland, and other institutions as the European Blood Alliance or IPFIA, who share some of the ideas I have presented here, the necessity of unpaid plasma donation 
the rational use of ICG and to think about donor safety. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Puig. Again, uh, in the interest of moving on uh, so that we have time for Q&A, I won't detain you with questions now, although I note with great interest uh, that uh, this is an example of a regional approach uh, because of the way Spain is organized, and I'm sure there's some interesting comments we can uh, urge you to explore in relation to that. Uh, I'm going to talk now, though, turn to instantly to uh, a representative of another authority, a national authority, the uh, Austrian Ministry of Health, Department for Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices, Blood, Tissue and Transplantation, represented here by Martina Brixis-Zulega. Thank you very much for being here, Madam Brixis-Zulega. Uh, as has been pointed out now, I think you're all clear about that, uh, in contrast to Spain and many other member states, plasma collection in Austria is performed by a mix of public and private sector centers, uh, as is the case also in Germany, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, as Matthew Hotchkin noted earlier. But I will let Mrs. Brixelega tell you more of that. So please, Martina, give us your views. Thank you. So good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to present our challenges and our um, approaches of solution, I think, in Austria. So next slide, please. So first of all, I would like to just give you a brief overview like uh, the previous colleague. Uh, Australia is a federal country with nine federal states. And uh, currently we have a population about 8.9 million people in Austria. And our main um, um, population in the age group of 20 to 64 is 61.7 percent. So that's the most important group uh, for donation. And in Austria, the first European plasmapherase center was opened in 1964. So we have a history of plasmapheresis in Austria. And currently we have uh, 18 approved plasma donation centers throughout Austria. They are all um, in the country, north, uh, uh, south, east, and west. And there are uh, these 18 plasma donation centers are all private. And this plasma is used for fractionation. So next slide, please. In 1975, the Plasma Phoresis Act came into force in Austria. And this regulated, among other things, uh, especially responsibilities, operating licenses, the qualification of staff, the donor suitability, and the inspection. So we have a history of regulation, a really old history. So in 1978, the Plasmapheresis Ordinance came then into additionally to the Act, and this included uh, more detailed requirements for plasma donation. And since 1999, now we have the so-called Blood Safety Act. Um, and this Blood Safety Act uh, changed a lot of things. And uh, one of the main points of this new law was the prohibition of manual aphorases in Austria. Um, this Blood Safety Act is now into force, um, and, but it will be amended as required. And um, this is based on more recent scientific findings, mostly, and on on, on new EU directives, um, yeah. So now we, the current legal framework in Austria, which is relevant in the plasma sector, is there for the Medicines Act, the Blood Safety Act, I've mentioned before, and the Blood Donor Ordinance that's associated with this Blood Safety Act. And this Blood Donor Ordinance implements the EU regulation and directive uh, 2004-33 and so there are the details of donation implemented and then we have the ordinance of regulations governing the operation and quality systems of blood donation facilities as well as we have um, pharmaceutical or medicines works regulation so we we are i think we are well regulated at the moment and maybe 
Interesting is that um, the operating license and the inspection are laid down in the Blood Safety Act. So that's really the main um, legal framework in Austria. And the plasma donation facilities um, and the whole blood uh, donation facilities are both required, um, both require an operating license. So they are on the same level regarding licensing. And the approval of the blood facilities is issued not by the ministry, it's issued by the Federal Agency for Safety and Healthcare, the so-called BASC, and it's on the basis of the application by the blood donation facilities. And very important is that in this licensing procedure, care must be taken to ensure that recipients of blood products are supplied and that the relevant blood donation institutions operating in the same local catchment area are to be heard in this procedure. Also, the BASC is responsible for the inspection and hemovigilance, and the BASC can also withdraw operating licenses. And the reasons doing that are laid down in the Blood Safety Act too. So next slide, please, because yeah. So what challenges do we see at the ministry that's responsible for the supply of blood products? On the one hand, it's a challenge uh, to ensure the supply of the patients with plasma products and um, thus to have enough plasma for production of pharmaceuticals. And on the other hand, to secure the supply with other blood products at the same time. And currently we are facing with covalescent plasma. And this places us, I think, in the situation that the potential donors in Austria would be important for both for plasma donation and whole blood donation. And with differences, um, especially that in Austria, the plasma donation for pharmaceutical production is carried out by the private sector. So uh, by profit organizations that pay a compensation. Um, Whilst the whole blood donation and most of the covalescent plasma donation for patients' care, so direct patients' care, are carried out by non-profit organizations, um, the, uh, the public sector, such as the Austrian Red Cross, and they do not pay um, direct expenses or compensations. And it's all um, with the knowledge that the voluntary and unpaid uh, blood donation at the Red Cross is, the, is our central pillar of the nationwide supply of the whole blood. But I have to say, um, nevertheless, this coexistence works in Austria very well at the moment. Um, yeah. So, and, and of course, there are other points. And another point is that due to our current situation of this possibility of expense allowance for donors. Um, some neighboring countries see these compensation payments as negative, as there um, seems to be perceived competition between the plasma donation centers, especially in regions close to the border. Yeah, so we are facing uh, with, with colleagues and, 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 and and, and other countries' needs in Austria. So last but not least, the current pandemic situation has also caused some uncertainties in the plasma donation area in Austria. And in order to support the plasma donation in spring in the first lockdown, uh, for our ministry, it was already clear that the donation is a valid reason for people to be able to leave their house and their homes. And that they have to be able uh, to donate. So, uh, and we decided to inform our health authorities about um, the need to support um, the, the, the donation centers um, regarding donation of reconvalescent plasma. Yeah, and nonetheless, all this um, needs to, uh, adherence with all necessary hygiene measures to prevent spreading the virus, of course, and uh, that are mandatory. They must be observed. So next slide, please, because that actually brings me to the solutions. 
Um, basically, I think there is no single solution that can be applied equally to all countries. Um, that's just an overview of our approaches. And I think the factor that influences our donation system the most, and um, I think that in, it's in a positive uh, sense, is the fact that Austrian culture is a culture of solidarity and cohesion and support and um, helping other people is very important to us and it's a matter of course. And I would say, my personal words, we take social responsibility in our country. Um, but of course, this, of course, this is not only evident in the area of plasma and blood donation. Um, it's also in many emergency situations in Austria, uh, which we are sometimes confronted with, um, like floods and avalanches or storms. Um, another essential point, very important point, is that we um, we used to have um, personal and direct contact and cooperation with the relevant stakeholders um, from the flood sector as well as uh, from the plasma sector. Um, so we have the um, representatives of the plasma sector and representatives of the whole blood donation sector in our National Blood Commission. Uh, and this commission advises the minister and in my experience is that the ministry has an open exchange with the stakeholders and I think that's very important to have. Um, and another point is in the same way that uh, we involve and, and listen to um, stakeholders and inform them, them, them about important decision, decisions from our ministry. So, of course, not all stakeholders have the same opinion and views, um, that's sure. Um, and of course, they have different needs, but I think nevertheless, it is um, important for us to find a consensus with everyone, or at least an acceptable compromise, uh, compromise if possible. And I think the next important point for the ministry is um, that we act neutrally. Um, but that is as long as the supply is not endangered. So we do not interfere proactively in the coexistence of plasma donation centers and, and other blood donation centers. So we accept this coexistence and see our role really neutral. And finally, however, I also see as essential is dealing with the potential donors for securing uh, our supplies. And we have great confidence in our health system and healthcare in Austria. And I think it is very important to maintain and strengthen this trust of our, um, our people. And it is also important to create awareness uh, of the need for supply and how everyone can contribute to it. So next slide, please, I think. So yeah, so this is now, this was just a short insight of, of our plasma uh, donation system in Austria, of course, in just an official view. So thank you. Thank you very much, Martina. And again, because time is moving on and we still have to, a couple of speakers to go, I'm gonna go straight on to uh, Stefan van der Spiegel, uh, who is uh, from the European Commission. Dr. Stefan van der Spiegel, Head of Health Information and Substances of Human Origin in the European Commission's Health Department. Uh, he will, I'm sure, put plasma issues into the context of the recently announced European pharmaceutical strategy and the revision of the blood products rules, and of course, the response to the COVID pandemic and related issues of shortages. So, Dr. van der Spiegel, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks again. Uh, for inviting us and, and thanks in particular to um, MEP Bonafé and, and uh, MEP Luena for um, bringing us together here on this uh, important topic. So indeed, uh, as Peter said in my uh, coming five to ten minutes, I, I just would like to briefly present our views and latest activities here at um, 
uh, in the European uh, Commission, which uh, in particular entail the plans uh, to revise the tissue and blood legislation and also uh, the pharmaceutical strategy, of course. Um, it's maybe upfront uh, important to recall, as uh, Peter did a bit uh, with the frame in the beginning, that um, the collection donation and testing steps of plasma fall under the blood legislation at the EU level, while the further manufacturing and then the distribution and putting it on the market fall under the pharmaceutical legislation. That's why you always have to look uh, from an EU legislative perspective uh, through a double um, pair of glasses uh, to this sector. So next slide, please. So why uh, did we start to legislate the, the blood sector uh, in the EU? That's uh, dating back actually to the 80s and 90s when we had across the EU uh, outbreaks or contaminations rather of, of uh, plasma derived products and other uh, blood um, components um, that transmitted uh, HIV, hepatitis C, also Creutzfeldt Jakob, there were high numbers of infected uh, recipients uh, across the EU and at that moment was decided to give a mandate uh, to the European Union. Next. Very schematically with that mandate uh, at EU level we have uh, drafted legislation which actually um, manages this um, flow from a substance from a donor body to a recipient body and there are different steps uh, in there um, that are also defined uh, in the legislation on which um, our, our aim is to lay down uh, safety and quality requirements. Next please. This entails three types and levels of requirements. One is on the on the professionals so on the collectors in this case of, of plasma uh, to work with the right donors to select or defer them well, to do testing on each donation and also to foresee um, some requirements on uh, how to handle the, the, the substance of plasma so that the quality stays good. Next. Then there's a second level of requirements that is on the national competent authorities. Uh, so in every country we um, need a, a a body and the government body that organizes the oversight of the actors and the collectors. So they need to be authorized, inspected regularly, um, and then there needs to be vigilance and traceability systems in place. And next, then there is, um, next please. Then there is also a set of requirements on us as EU level that is really to support uh, those different levels to work well together. For example, through platforms for alerts when that is needed. Next, please. Um, last uh, year, we, um, we finalized an evaluation exercise of this legal framework that I just presented because that legal framework for the blood sector is a bit older. It dates back to 2002. So we wanted to see if it's still fit for purpose and if it also um, realized its objective of improving safety quality. And I have no side on that, but actually the good news is that it, uh, the safety quality is quite good for um, blood tissue cell uh, therapies. Nevertheless, there are a couple of shortcomings identified that we uh, were really need to look at and that are now on our more political agenda. And I think the first one here, there's very, there were five key shortcomings uh, identified. And the first one that I, I want to present here at first is, is the one, actually the last one that we, in the report, but um, important for today is, is that actually it, it really, uh, highlights that there is a, um, a concern on, on dependency in Europe from the US for having sufficient plasma to manufacture plasma derived medicinal products for our EU citizens. And actually, if you look at the global scale and the MRB data were presented before, the, 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 the global population is actually highly dependent on, this, on the collection uh, in the US from a small, uh, limited part of the po world population. Next. Um, so in the last uh, weeks, uh, the Commission has decided a follow-up step on those uh, shortcomings uh, that were identified um, in the evaluation. And that follow-up step will be the, the revision of the legislation which goes hand in hand with an incept, inception impact assessment. So we need, of course, to assess possible measures that can be proposed to address this um, 
concerns uh, and here in particular for the for the supply concerns there were uh, there's measures that are proposed related in particular to to the monitoring so that we have a better monitoring on where the um, a view on, on where the different substances come from and, and go to and also we get, we can have early signals if there are shortages uh, expected and then also uh, possibilities for emergency uh, supply measures are considered in there next please there's another finding, however, that I, I want to put on the table here, and, and that uh, concern uh, that was identified in the evaluation was the fact that not um, all citizens are well protected. In particular, we see there is no sufficient protection of the donors uh, in our EU legal framework. We have a, historically a lot of measures to make sure the recipients stay safe, but there are there is a lack of uh, protection of donors. And that is, of course, very important for different blood tissue cell therapies but also for plasma collection because plasma donors are asked to donate frequently and give quite some volumes of, of um, liquids so it's important that we are ensuring that they can do this in a safe way that if there are problems that they are well reported and, and followed up to it's this kind of trust uh, is essential to allow that we have um, plasma collection and in particular to allow that we have more plasma collection in the EU because in the end we all depend on the on the donations from uh, those um, donors. Next. Um, that was in the legal framework. Beside, I also wanted to bring you a couple of um, actions that we laid out together with our colleagues in the Council of Europe and the European Director of Quality of Medicine. With them, we organized uh, last year a symposium on uh, plasma supply. And it was a really, I think, a first and, and a good um, opportunity to bring all the actors together in, in one big room, uh, not just Commission European Council, but also the member state. And then, of course, on, on the next side. Next, please. Yeah, also manufacturers, blood establishment and collectors, patient associations, donor associations, and professional societies. So the doctors uh, that are using these therapies. And um, that was very valuable because in the end, a problem like this, where you want to um, get more plasma, you cannot just fix that with legislation. What you need is actions by all the actors in that chain from donor to recipient and also of course with the authorities that oversee that uh, chain uh, so all those actors need to be engaged and uh, everybody has to take um, some part of the responsibility and take some part uh, of the actions and that can so across those chain and that is as well public actors as, as private actors um, if you would look and i'm not going to go in detail here but you you see there's a, a whole list of different set of recommendations here that were brought forward. Uh, they cover monitoring actions, uh, facilitating, make it, making the legislation um, more um, fluid. Uh, also the interaction between those two frameworks, plots and pharma to make that more fluid. But there's also measures on, um, on actually optimal use. And, and it was very interesting to see uh, as first presentation, the presentation by uh, Dr. Malawi, on uh, how the, the doctors and friends are looking into the best use for, for, the, for the therapies. So the, uh, there is really a need for all actors to, to contribute and, and, and do part of this uh, work if we want to come to a solution to have sufficient plasma for our patients uh, in the EU. Next. And then, of course, I cannot pass a, a presentation I think, without talking about COVID. And, and we have seen that COVID actually brings um, pros and cons uh, for for plasma collection. The, the big con and the concern, of course, at this moment is, is the risk for interruption. I think it was uh, presented a couple of times already before. Uh, also, Johan referred to it, the, the risk for interruptions because of the, the drops in collection of volumes in uh, the mainly the second quarter of uh, 2020, um, which would result in, in, in yeah, possible interruptions in supply uh, next year. Um, it's uh, as together with our colleagues from the European Medicines Agency, so who sit on the pharma framework, we try to monitor that. We have regular interactions with the, with the manufacturers and um, before summer, the, the 
there were no concerns yet, but we now see indeed seeing uh, first concerns about uh, uh, supply um, uh, insufficiency. Um, what we also try to do to work on with our colleagues in the EMA is, is to make the regulatory framework as flexible as possible so that the, the collected plasma and, and derivatives can really be, um, the collection can continue and, and the, the, the manufacturing as well as, as the distribution can be as smooth uh, as possible. Um, next. But there's also opportunities coming out of COVID for the plasma sector. In particular, we've seen that one of the most promising therapies to treat uh, ill patients with COVID is coming from plasma. It are those antibodies in the plasma that can be used for critical ill patients after collecting them from recovered patients. Um, there's some good data on that uh, in the US and, and uh, this still further studied and it still needs to be further studied. Of course, the, the context is slowly changing if uh, vaccination becomes uh, available, um, but there still are people who, who get to a hospital and for them, this can be a valuable therapy. In that context also, we, we see um, that there has been more interest in plasma donation and calls for it amongst other, our own commissioner has, in June at the occasion of World Blood Donor Day, made a call to also make uh, plasma donations. And we have also, um, as the European Commission used the European support instruments to help the, the blood services in the different countries to strengthen their collection capacities for this COVID specific plasma. But that of course is also collection capacity that can be used it afterwards for plasma, overall plasma collection. Next please. And then there's the, the second element, the pharmaceutical legislation. And there also, as you've seen last month, we have published our pharmaceutical strategy. Uh, again, very much also influenced by the COVID crisis. And you will see there's a lot of elements here that are relevant for the discussions we need to have uh, in this uh, platform. Crisis management preparedness, dependency on active ingredients. That's actually comparable to dependency of plasma from the US shortages and, and the international aspects. So those elements are covered in the pharma strategy. Next. Um, so um, our commissioner actually from day one has been asked by our, by, by our president, Ms. van der Leyen, to, to really look into ways to help the supply of affordable medicines to, to the citizens in the European Union. Uh, so I think this is really a, a key element uh, at heart of our commission policy at this moment. And also, uh, as you've seen uh, at heart of the, of the pharmaceutical strategy. Next, please. So there's four pillars that have been uh, presented in the pharmaceutical strategy last month. Of course, there's the learnings from the COVID crisis. There's the accessibility, affordability, sustainable uh, innovation, um, but in particular, the, the, the medicine shortages and the, the strategic autonomy that is to be secured. And I think that is a very relevant uh, element of discussion if we uh, today are going to discuss further on, on the plasma supply in Europe. Next. So there is uh, a lot of objectives uh, uh, that have been put on the table for possible actions. Obviously, as I already indicated a little bit from our own work on plasma, overall an efficient regulatory system for pharmaceuticals. Um, I also want to underline the accessibility objective for, for patients, the security of supply, the affordability. Uh, so that are aspects um, that will resonate very much, I think, for this discussion. Next, please. And uh, to and as a first step at this moment, we, we, um, we have started and contracted a study to help uh, identify characteristics and root causes of the shortages uh, in the EU. We have for medicines also to assess whether uh, the, our legislation is providing really the right tools to prevent those shortages or, or to mitigate them and, and to lay out what could be possible solutions uh, for that. Next. Okay, so in a nutshell, that was what I wanted to present uh, you, Peter, uh, today. So those uh, aspects on, on plasma supply, which are quite complex, cover um, 
two sets of legislation at EU level, uh, the blood legislation on the one hand, the pharma legislation on the other hand, but the good news is that both are now uh, on the table for uh, improving and, and that might give us some opportunities for our um, for improving also the, the plasma supply for the PDMPs, um, for the patients in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, covering a, a lot of ground uh, very comprehensively there. We're in the classic situation, of course, of having excellent speakers covering such a wide range of topics that our time is starting to become a bit pressing. So I'm going to, we'll come back, I'm sure, with some questions to you all. But I'm going to move straight on to Michael Fuhr, because none of this plasma we're discussing would be available without donors. Human donation is the only source for it. Uh, and it's a great pleasure, therefore, to be able to introduce you to one of the people who choose to offer their plasma. And Michael Fuhr from Berlin, who's here just as a private citizen to talk of his experience. So welcome, Mr. Fuhr, and thank you for taking part. Give us, please, a, a brief overview of your experience. Hello, all together. My name is Michael Fuhr. I'm from Berlin, as you said. I'm sitting here in, my, in front of my colleague's computer because I'm not real an, I, an IT pro. I'm a donor now for almost six years. It came up, a friend brought this topic up and uh, we wanted to do something for society. And we double checked that many people need plasma. So we went into the HEMA donation center and we go on annually for almost six years. And I really like it. Uh, my profession is I, work as a chef nearly all my life and I was always a bit of overweighted here yeah? and it changed my life my nutrition got better I um, eat less fat I felt healthier and I like the the the, um, the check the, the health check every time when I come to the nation center the people are very friendly and it, it's a good feeling to be a donor Hello. Thank you very much. That's a, a terrific testimonial to it. And I love the way you approach it as something that you actually enjoy as well as uh, a sense of moral duty or whatever, because you say there's a certain camaraderie in this, which is, it sounds very appealing indeed. Uh, maybe you, you can also tell us a little bit more about how it, what's a typical month for you or a typical three or four months? I don't know exactly how often you donate. Just give us a, a quick idea of, you know, the, is it two, twice a month, or twice a year, twice a century? Tell us what you're... I think you've turned your microphone off. Perhaps yeah. you need to unmute. Yeah, sorry. Yes. It's on now? Yeah, 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 I hear you very yes, well. Yes, yes. It's on now, thank you. Uh, I donate approximately every two weeks but max for about 30 times a year. Mm -hmm. And do you have, you said you talked about doing it with other friends and so on. Uh, do you have a lot of sort of friends and acquaintances who uh, are doing this with you? And, and have you got a lot of friends who know about the fact that you're doing it? Is it a sort of matter of public record as it were? You're, or you, you run a restaurant. Do your clients know that you uh, are a frequent uh, plasma donator, donor as well? Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, my one friend Peter and me, we came uh, first time to, to the donation center, which was about nearly six years ago, what I said, yeah. And after that, more people joined us, yeah. Okay, so you, you've got a, what they call a multiplier effect in this curious uh, Brussels bubble we work in here. Uh, what, uh, what about people who don't donate and who know that you're doing it? What, what do they think of it? Do they regard you as a bit odd or do they sort of admire you from a distance or just not talk about it at all? Most of them, yeah. They say that's my business and they don't talk about it. But many people, yeah, we have even a lot of clients who are very old and they really like what we are doing. Uh, one of the things that's come up over and over again in this discussion this afternoon is this question of awareness. Uh, you became aware of it, as you said, in your own particular way. Uh, although it's obviously you've got a very personal direct connection with this I imagine you're also aware of the broader picture do you feel that there is a level of awareness in well in the places you live and work or indeed at a more broad level in the country itself about 
the merits, the value of plasma donation and the eventual use that it's put to? Or do you think that more needs to be done to raise awareness? There is for sure the way there is for sure the awareness, but I think there must be more published. Yeah. How much do we need it? What the people for cancer or, or people have burned skins or whatever. There's a lot of different things you need plasma for, yeah. And I think you we should need more advertising for it. Okay, well, look, thank you very much for this very brief introduction. And we'll come back to it, I'm sure, if we have time. Uh, but for the moment, thank you very much indeed for coming along with that personal testimony. I'm going to introduce rapidly now Matthias Gessner. Thank you. Uh, he is uh, moving from a donor to the collector. It's a logical step to take in our review of plasma. Matthias is the chair of the European Plasma Alliance, which brings together 11 European private sector plasma collectors. He's also a senior executive in Takeda and consequently is well placed to give us an industry perspective on the situations and challenges of plasma collection in Europe. So Matthias, bearing in mind the fact that we are running a little bit late, please give us your view of the situation. Thanks, Peter, for the introduction. And yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Thanks to the organizers. Um, if I could have the first slide, just uh, a very brief overview about the European Plasma Alliance. So we are uh, alliance which is representing actually 10. Uh, I, I did the count again. It, it's, it's 10 European plasma sector collectors and uh, our organizations, uh, our members are active in uh, 140 centers currently in, in Germany, Austria, Czech Republic and Hungary in uh, collection of plasma, compensated plasma collection. And as you can see there, in 2019, 2.9 million liters were collected in, in these centers. So if, if you look at the numbers that Matthew showed in the beginning, that's about 30% of the, the plasma available in 2019 or collected in, in Europe in 2019. So quite a substantial uh, contribution to the overall availability of plasma in, in Europe. Um, if we move to the, to the next slide, I, I think that that's actually, I can keep this very brief because the, the issues have been covered quite extensively. So the increasing, the growth of, of uh, plasma uh, IgG consumption, uh, differences in, in, uh, in usage in, in countries, but also, uh, uh, as was pointed out by Nizar, a, a large number of people probably not, not even receiving treatment. And uh, in Europe, four countries uh, that are already mentioned with only 15% of the population, as Matthew pointed out, collecting 39% of European plasma in, in private uh, plasma centers. And if you look at the map here, you can clearly see which are the four countries uh, that are collecting in, in this way. Because if you look at the collection volumes per thousand inhabitants, you can see there's a significant difference between the four countries that allow compensated plasma donation compared to all the other countries that, that do not uh, perform uh, this kind of of donation. On the next page, I just summarized that uh, what, what we've already heard over, over the last nearly two hours, there is an increased need and, uh, and it's getting more and more uh, uh, pressuring to increase the, the, the volume of plasma collected in, in, in Europe. I think this has been realized in, in a number of resolutions, as you can see here, in uh, assessments and in, in strategies uh, sharpened by the, the fact of the COVID crisis now. So this has always all been, been covered already, and I would like to go to my last slide um, to come up with the, the question, what can we do? And, and I think that's the part where I think that the, the private plasma collectors and the compensated plasma donation can really make a, a difference uh, if we are willing to, to extend this to more countries in, in Europe. It could be a key to provide sufficient plasma for Europe. So given the, the growing clinical need on one side and the already now significant reliance on US plasma and the risk of supply disruption that we've realized now with the COVID crisis, in order to increase the, 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 uh, the, the volume of plasma collected, uh, we need to make changes on the EU level, but especially also on national policy level, because 
largest part the legislation the regulations around uh, plasma and blood collection is is done nationally so the first and most important step would be to go to the establishment of plasmapheresis programs this has already been been asked also by johan and to start outreach campaigns towards plasma donors in 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 an uh, approach to increase awareness because even if plasma collection is available in many cases people are not aware of this possibility and how important it is to to donate plasma we heard about the protection of donor health which of course uh, is an important or paramount uh, topic in in collection in blood and plasma collection and regulations in this sense uh, need to be based on scientific data uh, and should of course uh, have the goal of protecting donut health to a maximum extent but at the same time I, I think what we also need to realize is that we need to recognize plasma donors for their contribution to society uh, very often my my impression is that uh, blood donation is is seen as the kind of of first line donation and plasma donors are a kind of it's a kind of second type of donation and I think we need to, to change here the recognition. Both donations are really very much important. Blood and plasma donation, and really depends on the disease that uh, you personally have, which one of, the, uh, of these two don uh, donation types is the real more important for a patient personally. What we need, and uh, that's a, a larger topic, I think, but uh, what we can see from the, uh, from the map that I showed you, we need compensation for inconveniences is an, an effort of plasma donors. Plasma donation is a lot more effort compared to blood donation. It is more frequent, it takes more time, and it's clear that there is a need to offer compensation for this additional effort. Otherwise, donors will not be able to sustain the longer term activities like Marcel uh, is doing for six years uh, in, in a very intense program. And we already have a, uh, uh, an example here looking at Article 12 of the Tissues and Cells Directive. I would think that enabling the contribution of the privately owned plasma collection centers would absolutely make sense because there's a lot of knowledge expertise available that could help to rapidly increase plasma supply in Europe. And this, as uh, Martina showed, in, in a well-regulated uh, positive coexistence with the public sector, complementing each other in, in plasma and, and blood collection. I think that's something that is feasible. It just needs to be done, I think. And then last point I would make here is that in order to, to have meaningful regulations around blood and uh, plasma, we need to, to have clear regulations and clear definitions, specifically around the fact what is plasma and also around uh, the topic of plasma donor compensation. So on the next slide, in addition to Marcel, I wanted to show you two plasma donors and at this point I would like to say many thanks to those who regularly go and donate plasma in one of the plasma centers. They make it possible that we have the PDMPs available for patients. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, and now since uh, we have uh, come to the end of our formal speeches and we have technically come to the end of our formal time, but we'll go a little bit over this. I'm going to, as I promise, at least offer some of the questions which the audience have been putting in. First of all, um, one to Martina. Are you still online there, Martina? Yes, hello. Uh, I have a question here from you from the audience. Uh, did you notice, since you introduced uh, private sector affairs in 1964, did you notice any drop in the uh, amount of blood collected from classic blood donation or any drop in the number of donors for classic blood uh, donation? Um, I have to say, I don't know. The only thing I can see that um, we, we, we have enough volume of whole blood and we have enough volume uh, of plasma to to support other countries, and I think that's that's the main point. <laughs> so we we have we have enough okay. uh, at the moment, but I don't know 
um, the difference is since 1964. Okay, well, no, but, that, that but was of your, course, that was when there you are differences that. since a year. But it's certainly yeah. not a current issue. You don't have any fears that uh, having the private sector and the uh, public sector working alongside present any um, risk to supply, as you've mentioned in your presentation. That would be a fair conclusion, presumably. I I think, um, sorry, I think, um, I think uh, the risk uh, of supply is the most important thing, but, but um, as I think Stefan mentioned it in the evaluation, uh, for us it's very important to, and, and you see it in the history of our, of our legal acts, the, um, the safety of the donors is very important for us. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that is one thing we can see in, in the changing of our legislations. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, a lot of questions came in uh, concerning the question, concerning increase in demand and uh, potential increase in supply difficulties. And uh, I think I'll, I'll bounce this to a certain extent off. First of all, Matthew, uh, if you're there, uh, do you have any indication, for instance, of whether the potential increase in China and India, where at the moment uh, immunoglobulin is rather underused, uh, is likely to alter the picture? Do you have any data or information on whether COVID has significantly influenced the collection of plasma in the, in the US? Uh, and do you have any uh, idea of what the impact of Brexit may or may not be in terms of uh, either the European level or the UK level of collection. So Matthew, do you want to have a quick shot at any of those you have any data on and then I'll pass it on to others. Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, hopefully you can hear me now. I'll talk about the US and uh, maybe Brexit briefly. Uh, on the US side, um, yeah, the collections are, are likely to be down. Uh, the question was, what were the costs going to be? down uh, 10, 15%, probably closer to 15 than 10% for the year. Um, they're still around 10% last month than, than the month 2019, November 2019 is 10% higher than November 2020. Um, so we, we, as probably many of you know, the coronavirus uh, situation is, uh, is one of, L of continuing increases recently in the United States. So that's leading people to be a little bit uh, cautious about what they do outside their house, and so less donations is part of that. Um, switching briefly to the UK and Brexit, um, I can't actually answer the direct question, but I do know, and there was one question about why the UK doesn't use any plasma um, for the production of immunoglobulin or other plasma-derived medicinal products, and that has to do with the GCAD, or the mad cow disease, that is about uh, 20 plus years now. Um, where there was no test and so they didn't know if plasma would have that issue or not but um, more recently actually very recently this year because of the um, coronavirus pandemic the, the UK government is having discussions again about the use of potentially collecting plasma and using that it would initially be definitely through a public government organization but using that for uh, fractionation so I think the, the UK um, country may change its its policies uh, in the near term at least on some level okay thank you very much for that um perhaps i can turn to you stefan some questions for you uh one yeah. of them is uh, the extent of urgency that you might feel about the risk of shortages particularly in view of the covid uh, impact on collection um and you've been asked whether 2021 might develop into a situation where the EU would be uh, calling a public health emergency because of shortages. That's one question. I'll chuck another couple at you at the same time. Uh, the others are related to whether there is any prospect of merging the blood products directive and the tissue and cells directives in the reorganization that you're considering at the moment. Uh, and the third is whether you have any indication of specific measures to be taken in respect of convalescent. Sorry, Peter, I, I didn't get free your third question. Okay, the, the third question was whether there are any measures to be taken in respect of convalescent plasma. Do you have anything particularly in mind? For I, that? 
Okay. Um, so first on your EU uh, public health emergency, um, I cannot really answer that uh, well, to be honest. I'm, I am sitting uh, on a field blood tissue cells, which is, of course, we all feel uh, very important here, but um, this kind of decisions and views are, are at, at a higher level um, taken in the EU. And, and obviously we always have to take into account that, that uh, COVID is now really putting a lot of issues, health issues on the EU political agenda. Uh, and I think it is already recognized in general that um, shortages for uh, pharmaceutical products are a concern. And that's, I think, a key message of our pharma strategy. Mm -hmm. I think also the, the um, supply risk that we have with the dependency of the EU is also clearly on the political radar, but I, I, it's not to me to make a kind of um, comparative judgments how important those elements are compared to other elements uh, in health that, that need to be tackled. Um, on your question about the, the merging of the directives, uh, yes, we will consider that. It's, it's something we will explore. It's not decided whether we'll do it or we will not do it. I think the question will be, um, w will it help us for our, our future um, ensuring safety quality in the sector? Both directives as they stand today have already a lot of similarity. There are similar um, requirements for authorizations for inspections for vigilance etc so that might be an option to merge but that if we do that obviously we still need somewhere to have um, more specific elements for yeah, blood for yeah. plasma for uh, different tissue cell therapies so uh, we still will have we'll have to have those reflections in a in a comprehensive view also looking into the secondary legislations and, and guidance that might be uh, needed um, then on, on your measures for convalescent plasma, Peter, I, I, I noted the question now, but I'm still not sure I fully understood it. Um, I think there's a lot that happened already to support the, 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 the collection of convalescent plasma and the studying of, col of convalescent plasma. Um, there was a central registry uh, brought together with um, the European blood establishments. There was um, a dedicated study from Horizon Europe. There is um, specific support as I presented under the European support uh, emergency instrument. Um, so uh, of course there's things that still are uh, like studies and, and uh, implementation that still are, are um, running and still will take a time before everything is, is in place. Um, is that what you refer to or are you meaning? That's probably to... what the questioner was, was yeah. asking. Yes, okay. so that would be very well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Nizar, Dr. Marie in, uh, in the Necker Hospital, are you still online there? I believe Nizar has left. I left. Okay, fine. Well, we'll look on. Uh, I have a question for Michael Fuhr. Uh, if he is still online there, uh, someone asked, do you feel appreciated for what you're doing? I don't know whether you'd like to give a view on that. Uh, certainly, certainly I do. Yeah, it was one of the best decisions. Yeah, to, to come as a donor. Yeah, and I will continue with that. And I feel appreciated, Peter. That, that is a very uh, definite answer to that. Look, I, well, thank you very much for that. Um, we could go on for hours, but we're not allowed to. So I'm going to bring this to a, a conclusion uh, before I introduce our closing remarks from our co-host here in the parliament. Uh, we've conducted uh, the last couple of hours, really, we looked at many of the realities of this plasma collection and transformation and use. And we've found many common contentions that emerged as evidently some growth in demand, there's a complexity in the provision, there are current gaps in sufficiency, there are risks to the future. Some solutions enjoy some wide support, there's raised awareness, I think everyone agrees about the need for raising awareness among donors, better monitoring of supplies, clearer definition of terms such as basic, uh, uh, terms, basic terms like blood uh, and plasma, distinctive regulatory frameworks that reflect the identified needs and continued efforts to overcome the COVID-related challenges as well, to see maybe the best solutions from that 
integrated into future rules. Uh, but they're at the same time very evident nuances of analysis. Uh, there's questions over the scale of genuine unmet need, uh, questions over the appropriateness of prescribing, nuances, quite big nuances over differences of approach to collection, whether it should be public or private sector or coexistence, whether it should be compensated or purely voluntary. Uh, there are discernible differences and indications of concern on some issues from different stakeholders. Uh, and that's not surprising. It's only to be expected in, in such a major topic with so many different interests at stake. Uh, on some of these issues, there's already an agreed body of evidence. And on, on others, the evidence being offered is still being assessed and will need to continue being assessed. So at present, a comprehensive solution to all the challenges is just not within reach must be pursued if it's going to arrive through further exchanges among all the engaged stakeholders. But it's only through those further exchanges that mutual understanding can be reached and any solutions will emerge. And I would hope that today has certainly helped establish a useful base for furthering that process. So uh, while I close this part of the set round table, I obviously want to thank the panelists and our hosts for making it possible. And I also signal that every single one of those 300,000 individuals, and apparently more to come, who are dependent on PDMPs, are still waiting for reassurance, still waiting for progress. And that puts the ball firmly back into the court of stakeholders and policymakers to ensure that progress is made. Uh, as a simple journalist, I shall be watching and reporting. For the moment, I thank you all. I hand the floor to our co-host for the formal closing of this roundtable, Spanish Socialist MEP Cesar Luena, who's uh, vice chair of the influential European Parliament Committee responsible for health. So thank you, Senor Luena, and for me, goodbye. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we have seen today uh, a strong commitment from patients, donors, physicians, industry, and policymakers to engage in a dialogue to collect more plasma in Europe. Thanks to the presentations and panel discussions, we have learned about the importance of plasma therapies and the supply of safe and high quality plasma. My main conclusion from your presentations is that more urgently than ever, more plasma needs to be collected across the European Union. This must start now without any delay to ensure that patients get the therapies they need to survive. Policymakers at EU and national level must take strong action and modernize legal frameworks and policies to generate concrete effects. Change to frameworks will be made based on scientific evidence and facts. To increase the plasma collection, we need an uh, approach focused on donors and patients and the collaboration between all stakeholders, public sector and private sector organizations. If there is no plasma, there is no medicine to the patients who need it. I would like to demand a call for action. EU and national policies must facilitate an increased plasma collection by establishing dedicated plasma collection programs and coordinate awareness, outreach campaigns towards plasma donors in all EU member states. Distinguishing between whole blood for transfusion and plasma for manufacturing PDMPs. And third, considering more regulatory flexibility to optimize plasma collection in Europe. As my colleague, Simona Bonafé, mentioned earlier, the EU pharmaceutical strategy and the uh, revision of the blood and tissues and cell legislation represent a timely opportunity to ensure that sufficient plasma in collect in Europe, not only now, but also in the long term. I would like to thank the speakers and the moderator, Peter O'Donnell, and all the participants. I am convinced that this is round table has served as an effective forum to share experience and ideas. Thank you so much and congratulations.
Bye-bye.